Hello and welcome back to Unheard. I am sitting here with none other than Constantin Kissin, a friend and fellow interviewer of the quote-unquote alternative media. And what we're here to talk about is Tucker Carlson. Because Tucker has, you may have heard, been to Russia recently. Not only did he do the enormous two-hour interview with Vladimir Putin, which we should spend some time on, and I know you've done shows on, but he's now followed up with these sort of what feel almost like promo videos from Moscow. And it's getting quite interesting. A lot of our audience are skeptical and worried about this, and a lot of them think that he's onto something, and anyone who is criticizing him for it is somehow controlled opposition or has joined the establishment or whatever else. So I want to start with the, with the wide question. What's your view on Tucker's Moscow travels? Well, as a, as a prominent representative of the controlled opposition, what I think, beyond the personality of Tucker Carlson, which we can talk about endlessly, is there is a, a historical parallel here, which is uh, George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw was a prominent intellectual in his time, and one of the things he was, you could almost argue, a pioneer in, is uh, pioneering the idea that we should all be skeptical about the things that we're being told. And he was a, an amazing playwright and contributed to intellectual discussions around the world. And he was seen as this very serious figure who then went over to the Soviet Union and worshipped Stalin. This is from the left. This is the new thing. I mean, this well, was, this was quite a common this. feature of past generations. The yes. kind of left-leaning ones had a bit of a soft spot for the Soviet we Union. We can get into why the right is doing this now. And I think there's a, a, actually a very important point there. But in terms of George Bernard Shaw, my, my point is first and foremost that the reason that Bernard Shaw, there was some personal adulation stuff when he went over to Russia, you know, they put out banners and flags and celebrated his 70th birthday. But actually the main reason uh, is the reason that I think a portion of the right has now uh, taken this position as well, is that uh, they're getting tired of democracy not working effectively is how they might describe it. Um, fed up of the fact that you can't vote your way out out of many of the problems that Tucker has spent quite a long time highlighting on a show. Rampant crime, homelessness, uh, an open border in the United States and increasingly here. So all of these things uh, create a, a, a perception in people that the current system doesn't work. And then the alternative, no matter how terrible and horrible and whatever, becomes more appealing because you're not really truly looking at it with your open eyes. And well, it's that sense of railways were on time, at least right. everything works properly in a kind of fascist dictatorship. Yes, and if you go to the center of Moscow, things do work quite well because that's where the, the rich and, and powerful live. Yeah. Elsewhere in Russia, not so much. But I, I do think what we're seeing is the wokeification of the right. If you think about uh, what woke is, right, it's a kind of resentment-based blindness to reality which says, our society is terrible and everything about it is terrible and we must constantly be punished for the sins of our ancestors. And therefore, uh, therefore, this is terrible, everything else is better, right? Uh, the workification of the right operates in a slightly different way where it's not about our society, it's about the elites. The elites of Western societies have destroyed the true West, have infiltrated it with trans, LGBTQ, uh, open border immigration, blah, 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 blah. And uh, therefore, it's not working. And by the way, you can't vote your way out of it because when you vote for Brexit, what do they do? Well, they try and overturn it. Eventually, they sort of half ass it. Never it happens. And the same with Trump. Yeah. Right. But this is particularly the quote unquote dissident right, yes. isn't it? Because the, the mainstream right in the US is not like this at all. No. They're still very confident that America is the best country in the mm -hmm. world. It's the Tucker Carlson group. Yes. And there is this sense, I find, that it's kind of sensible skepticism brave pointing out of taboos, all of which we support. Mm -hmm. That's why what we do what we do in a way. You know, I'm all for pointing out the things that the people in power don't want said, yes. even if they mean they're uncomfortable for us as a country. Yes. You know, so, so saying the things we've done wrong yes. in foreign policy, in economics, you know, being critical of ourselves, that I'm also all for. But it's a sense that, yeah, it's now reached a kind of darkness of worldview where not only have people been incompetent in the past and our leaders have basically been shit, which I would agree with mm -hmm. to a high degree, but it's the sense that it's sort of deliberate, that uh, there are shadows everywhere, mm -hmm. in every corner there is, you'll find the, the, the trail lead you back to this central evil that is somehow situated in America. Mm -hmm. That is the I feel like what Tucker is edging up against now. Well, the, the, if you st 
stare constantly into the abyss of skepticism, eventually you become a cynic. And there's a difference between being skeptical and being cynical. And I think what you're talking about is a cynicism. But the conspiratorial element of it, I think, is a reflection of what I said, which is when you feel powerless, when you feel that you're not in control of your destiny, when you feel that you have no way of impacting the future of your society through the means you're being told are the means by which to do that, which is your vote. Uh, it's quite natural then to become conspiratorial about it and to start to imagine a shadowy cabal and there's, there's always going to be little bits of evidence that this happened or the CIA did this or whatever. And uh, it's a very appealing worldview to, to people who feel powerless. The people who are most susceptible to it are intelligent people who are used to feeling like... Mm, I they... don't think so. Well, <laughs> Sorry. No, I do. I, I feel like, <laughs> at least if you think you are, you know, it's that sense that I've got a bit of an edge over everyone else. You know, I've read a bit more. I've, I've joined the dots a bit more than other people. And therefore, I know that actually, if you look beyond the headlines, you see the CIA did this or America was complicit in this. And a lot of those components are, have truth in them. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we don't, no one wants to whitewash the, the West or the US or any of those things. But somehow that has now grown into this sense that they only they understand the true evil of the West. Yes. And almost every story can be explained through that prism. Yes. Uh, and uh, this is why I think having yourself, you, you, you talk earlier about um, us challenging the mainstream narratives on certain things. But when you do that, you have to be grounded in a certain reality. The reality objectively is that the West, while it has many problems that we've been discussing ad nauseum on both our shows, it nonetheless remains the beacon of all the things that we all actually think are important. Individual uh, freedom, government by consent. And these things, by the way, are being threatened, as we've talked about. And so it's correct that we continue to push back on that, but not from the position of believing that the West is worse than everywhere else, because that's like the woke left position, factually inaccurate. It's almost a kind of naivety. You talk about individual freedom, government by consent. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee in the comments underneath this video, quite understandably, yeah. people will be listing examples where that hasn't been true. Of course. You know, and I, I put out a, a piece on Twitter earlier today and a huge number of replies. It was about Navalny. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I said I was looking forward to Tucker Carlson's upcoming missive from <laughs> Moscow about the, the death of Alexei Navalny. And then why no mention of Assange? Actually, we've had Stella Assange on the show. You know, why not Gonzalo Lira? Why not all of these examples of where the West has either imprisoned people, the January the 6th conspirators or mm. people who partook in that? My answer is, yeah, if you believe in the ideals, you want to criticize the West for making those mistakes. Mm. But it's not the same as Russia. No, because it's not the norm. And we are allowed to be outraged about it because it's the deviation from the norm. It's, it's, it's a subtle difference, but I think it's the well, huge I'm importance. I'm curious difference. what people think would happen to, say, a Russian journalist who went over to America, interviewed the president of the United States, uh, talked about the corrupt leaders in my own country are ruining everything. Uh, and isn't everything wonderful here? And then went back to his own country in Russia, what do people think would happen to him? I've come to the place where I don't actually think uh, there's much value in arguing with people who have decided that the West is evil, whether they're woke leftist or whether they're woke rightist in this way. They have decided that the West is evil. And uh, I don't know how much persuading is going to work on those people. For the rest of us, uh, I think uh, it's important to keep grounded in reality. The reality is the West is the best place uh, if you want to have individual freedom and if you want to have uh, government by consent and if you want to have uh, wealth and prosperity, which kind of matter too. Uh, but the, all of those things are a threat, which is why we've all been raising the alarm. And it is important that we continue to do that without devolving into thinking that Vladimir Putin uh, and Russia under Vladimir Putin is somehow a better place on all those metrics. Yeah, You mentioned Moscow mm -hmm. recently, I think it was in the last week. Tucker has been releasing these little shorts from his The shopping Russia carts trip. are amazing. <laughs> the shopping carts are amazing because they have this special little voucher, which I think I've seen in uh, Sweden and in the UK well, and everywhere. Just on that point, Freddie, it's so fascinating to me but the, the, because I share Tucker's amazement uh, when I first came to England when I was 13 years old from Russia. Because, of course, these old things are Western inventions that we've had in this country for decades. And I was amazed to see, oh, shopping trolley, you can put a coin in and whatever. Um, so I don't, I don't actually understand who is impressed by 
uh, the fact that there's a shopping trolley. Or, by the way, he put another one out where uh, the replacement for McDonald's, which is stolen all McDonald's recipes. Was better. Uh, uh, as good. As, as good. Mm-hmm. Um so the, why is that? I don't, I've never understood why that's impressive. But. And then, and then, most recently, it was the central station in Moscow. Yes, which was not only accompanied with stirring violin music mm. as we got a kind of montage mm. of this station, but he was clearly blown away by the station. I he mean, would be. I mean, the Moscow yeah. Metro is a, an incredible sight to behold. It's what, for me one of the wonders of the world. Yeah, but. In that montage, and I encourage people to go and look at it, are these kind of propaganda mosaics from the communist mm-hmm. era of kind of strapping laborers looking happy as they're tilling the soil. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a, it, it's, they're then surrounded by these elaborate gilt frames, very much in the kind of autocratic dictatorial aesthetic, I would say. To my mind, those kind of like showy, pristine, perfectly functioning showpieces are usually found in autocratic regimes where there's a lot of poor people out of sight suffering uh, who are basically paying for these small number of baubles in the capital. So I'm, I'm really genuinely amazed that Tucker Carlson would, would go to Moscow and be so flabbergasted by the metro and take that as a sign somehow that it's a, a better functioning government or better functioning country. Is that naivety? Am I being unfair? What is your explanation for that? Uh, I don't think it's naivety. I think, as I said, Tucker has an ideological position which he has come to after many, many years of criticizing Western leaders, which is uh, to you know see the good in, in the other and not in your own society. Uh, in his case, because of the frustration with the direction of his own society, which to, to a large extent I share. But uh, I experienced this, for, experienced this firsthand because I've been on his show a couple of times and the last time I was on it, you may not be invited back after this. Uh, I, whatever, I couldn't care less. Uh, I suggested that we talk about Ukraine to his producer, uh, which was met with a level of uh, resistance that I had not encountered previously. Why do you think he was not? Clear? Well, what I was told is if you if if you raise this issue with Tucker, it will get heated, and then you may not be invited back. So, for your interest, it's best that we don't do this. Right. So my point is, Freddie, that I don't think that on this particular issue, Tucker's acting as a truth-seeking journalist. I think he's ideologically driven to present a a, a picture of the world to his audience, who by this point are quite keen to lap it up. And I want to say at this point, I like the presence of people like Tucker Carlson very much. Me too. That's why I've appeared on the show. I generally support people who are asking these awkward questions, even if they are wrongheaded because it makes the media and the conversation a more lively place. And I do actually genuinely believe we will get closer to truth out of that kind of chaos than we will through a very strictly controlled narrative. So I'm all for Tucker Carlson in theory, which is why I'm even more disappointed. I'd like just now to talk about the Putin interview, because that was more substantial Mm. than these little sort of tourist snippets from Moscow. And as an interviewer, if that doesn't sound grandiose. The idea of interviewing Putin, obviously I would like to do it. Mm. I presume you would say yes if he offered you, he, I guess he, you, might, you, might, worry, you yeah. might worry that he'd yeah. imprison you. So the whole idea that it was in some way traitorous to interview Putin I thought was stupid. Yes, I was worried that he wouldn't kind of challenge him, which I think was borne out. I don't mm. think he challenged him. He did at the end. There was a little bit. Yeah. I mean, after one hour and 45 minutes of kind of being lectured mm. to, um, so I think it's fair to criticise him for it. It's also fair, I think, that that certain things weren't raised. For example, Navalny would have been a, if he literally had just come from Belmarsh Prison, where he'd interviewed Julian Assange. If he, if Tucker feels so strongly about political prisoners, it would have been reasonable to mention Navalny. But then I also realise that it's extremely difficult because you're damned if you do and damned if you don't with those kind of interviews. And you you saw just oozing out of every pore that he wasn't really going to be interrupted. He was just going to carry on talking. He'll say, I'll finish my point, you know, young man. You can say whatever you like. And he's the president of Russia and he is all powerful in his country. So I did also feel sympathetic in a way. I think it's it's easier said than done to suddenly challenge Vladimir Putin inside the Kremlin. Do you think you could have done a better job? I think I'm probably, from given that Putin gave an, an hour or close to an hour of historical lecture, uh, I'm probably slightly better prepared on that simply by virtue of having been taught Russian history, etc. In terms of interview technique, do you think there was a way of doing that 
that could have got more out of him, that could have made him more uncomfortable. Oh, you, but, but I don't think the point of an interview is to make somebody uncomfortable. So I, that's not right. what I would have sought to do. What I could see clearly, if you notice right at the beginning, Tucker says, well, I've got the quote. And he's about to quote something to Vladimir Putin. And actually, he has a very good line of questioning, which is, you keep bringing up Russian history, essentially to imply that Ukraine is your land, which is effectively what Putin spends 40 minutes doing. But he never then actually challenges him on this. And Putin keeps saying, we'll get to that, we'll get to that. And Tucker never actually brings that up. Now, in fairness, we both know that in the middle of an interview, particularly of that caliber, of that significance, etc., it may be quite difficult to keep everything in your head, etc. So um, uh, in the cold light of day watching from the outside, there are things that could have been done better, whether Tucker sh you know, was in a position or should have done. I actually don't have any criticism of him for that. What I would have liked to have been explored is what Tucker tried to explore, which is you've spent 40 minutes telling me that you know, the history of Russia and Ukraine and how they're interwoven, are you saying this is your land? And actually press him on this to the point where you get an answer, which he never did. So he didn't really follow through. On that. Uh, and I think for, for many of the reasons that you've just described, which is, I imagine when you're an American journalist sitting in the Kremlin against the man who's all powerful in this country, you, you know, suddenly the, the gumph that you maybe have come into with uh, disappears a, a little bit. So net net overall, do you think Tucker Carlson is a force for good or not? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that uh, his Russia trip hasn't convinced me that he is a force for good, but he's done some other very good work highlighting things that really matter. And driving the narrative on them, which has been really important. You know, I think that uh, the situation with illegal immigration, for example, in America needs to be highlighted. And the fact that he's been doing that has been really, really important. Um, bit of a politician's answer. Can't uh, no, no, I'm impressed. It, no, but it's not a politician's <laughs> answer because I'm actually being honest. I don't like to boil people down to very simple a force for good or not force for good in the same way that I'm not a force for good or for bad. Some people like things about me and dislike others. So what I'm saying is I think that his Russia trip has not shown him in the best light. And I think on, on in the... With the benefit of hindsight, will not be something that he's uh, seen as having done good. Uh, there's other stuff that he's done that's been very Although good. Although I would say there were useful things that came out of it. The For me, the most significant was the apparent openness to a deal from Putin. I feel like... Is that what you took away from that? Well, I, I think the fact that that was being volunteered was actually more of a sign of weakness than strength. And I, I, I feel like... Yeah, that was new information. Well, I watched it and it's somewhat in Russian, so we may have seen a somewhat different tone in interview. I didn't get that read from Putin at all. So it was always clear from day one that Putin is open to a deal on Putin's terms. And what he reinforced repeatedly in that conversation, if you remember, Tucker asked him repeatedly, what, you know, would you consider calling the president of America? Would you consider getting in touch? And Putin sits there with this smug face and goes, why would I call them? they need to call me, right? So I, I, the, to me, that wasn't somebody who was signaling the need for negotiations. That was somebody saying, I've got all the trump cards. I'm he winning He could have said Ukraine. the time has passed. He said, I was interested no, in a deal. He, we had one. They've screwed it up. Sorry. But he didn't say that. Well, that's kind of what he did say. He basically was implying that, you know, there was a time for negotiations. They called it off. Boris Johnson intervened. The Americans intervened, whatever. Uh, and now I've got all the Trump cards. I'm sitting here in the Kremlin with my legs spread. Now you come to me. So what do you think the key takeaway was? I think the, the key takeaway was very clearly that Putin feels in control. And, and uh, I think that's quite an appropriate thing for him to feel. He has cleaned out all the internal opposition that arose in the course of the war from both left and right. Now he, Navalny is off the picture, so he's not going to galvanize anybody from the liberal opposition. Um, uh, Igor Girkin Strelkov is in prison now, who was a vocal critic of his from the nationalist side of things. Uh, you know, the fate of Evgeny Prigozhin is now well known to the world. Um, uh, so he's, he's tidying house. Uh, he's tidied the house. The Prior house, the house the, is rather tidy at prior this point. Prior to the nominal election. Yes. Uh, and in terms of the, the conflict in Ukraine itself, um, he feels that he has broken the West's moral 
back, which I think is based on what I observe accurate, which saddens me, but nonetheless is true. And he feels that he's in charge and he's acting like it. You mentioned Navalny. Do you uh, presume that he was murdered? I, I genuinely don't know. I, it would. It's very possible that he died because of mists or maltreatment. Mm. It's very possible that he was murdered deliberately. It's very yeah, possible. Those yeah. labor camps are notoriously tough. Yeah, and it's uh, he's fifty odd years yeah. old. It's possible he just yeah. didn't. So the it. truth is, I I believe we will never we will never know what happened. And again, I'm, I've got quite good at anticipating the kind of comments we get. You spend too much are, time on your Twitter, well, Freddie. No, I'm thinking about uh, under and this YouTube, video even worse. that I want to hear from the wonderful people who are watching this video. Mm. And I think some of them will say, well, Navalny wasn't such a good guy after all. He, he wasn't. He was associated with far right. He has all sorts of rallies and things that he attended. He wasn't associated in, with the far right, but he was past. xenophobic. He was very much part of a kind of superior Russian movement. And he wasn't a liberal in any way that we could identify. By Russian standards, he was. But that says more about Russia than Navalny. Possible CIA uh, contrivance. What do you think of that? Uh, I, I, I was never one of the people who thought Navalny was the savior of Russia. I, for a start, his comments on Crimea and essentially the, the idea that Russia should keep Crimea having annexed it uh, told me that this was uh, a guy who, who wasn't, you know, going to oppose the nationalist agenda in Russia. Um, and it's true that he made some comments, certainly by Western standards, would be considered racist and xenophobic about various minorities in Russia. By the way, if all of that was true mm. and worse, and he was deeply embedded with the CIA, still doesn't mean that putting someone in a hard labor camp and either killing them or letting them die is a good way to run a country. Well, obviously, and that, yeah, that's, that's it feels like it's going. worth saying. What Navalny did very well, and this comes back to your point about a politician's answer, uh, is he investigated corruption in Russia and he showed uh, the public uh, where the money that was being siphoned off from Russia, effectively becoming a, a giant petrol station, was going I mean, to palaces and so on. Uh, which was good. I, th I thought that was important. Uh, and he became, you know, a principal opponent of a tyrannical, authoritarian, corrupt, kleptocratic regime in Russia. And for that, you know, I had tremendous respect to him for doing that. Does that mean that he was the perfect human being? No. Um, but I And think bravery, I think, you have to, is completely unambiguous. I mean, to get on that plane and go back after everything that had happened and yeah. having been poisoned, knowing that you probably would end up in prison yeah. is... You know, an incredibly brave thing to do. I agree. How do you draw a line yourself between that sense of exploring, being skeptical, being open minded to those things that might be, you might not currently think are true, but are just in the penumbra where they might become more true? How do you deal with those when you hear them, when people are trying to encourage you further and further in a direction? What do you turn to for wisdom about what you think is true and what you don't think is true? Well, well, the first thing that helps is there's more than one of me. Francis and I see the world very differently. So on trigonometry, uh, there's always raging debates about all sorts of things, not just between Francis and I, but the whole team. Uh, so there's a variety of perspectives on all sorts of things. Uh, and some so you argue it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and also, by the way, I have a very strong... Um, I, I try, don't always succeed, but I try very hard to maintain a very clear delineation between things on w which I know and on which I have a strongly held view and everything else, which is the overwhelming majority of things on which I'm completely ignorant. And so if we were to have somebody on to talk about, I don't know, vaccines or COVID or whatever, I'm aware that I'm not an expert. And so I am open to hearing all sorts of different perspectives without necessarily believing them. And in our space, there, are, in my opinion, have been a lot of people who went from, you know, maybe we shouldn't give vaccines to children to, you know, COVID is a hoax or whatever the, the, line, the line is. It's basically gut instinct at the end. You've discussed it with people you respect and you take a view on, on where to draw the line between things that are definitely not true, things that mm. are possible or maybe plausible, and then right down the road to things that you think are completely out of the realm of possibility. Yeah, and sometimes you have to have people on your show and speak with them to understand whether you agree with them or not. We have people on our show that I disagree with all the time. Your question is pointing to something that's very true, which is we live in, in a society in which it's very difficult to know how to get to the truth. And this has been one of the huge successes of, um, among others, Russian 
uh, disinformation efforts, which is not the, the propaganda of the Yuri Bezmenov period in the Soviet Union was to say, you know, you must believe the Soviet Union is the greatest society ever created. And people at the time would fall for that. Now that doesn't really work. Uh, and so you've got a new version of it, which is much more powerful, which is, well, I don't know what's true and leave it there. And so once you've got people to that place of, I don't know what's true, it's very easy for them to then be, well, I don't know what's true. Maybe Russia is better than America. He is the kind of master troll, Putin, in that respect. He's very good at sowing uncertainty. My uh, prism for interpreting what Vladimir Putin says is that he is a very, very highly trained uh, former KGB agent. And so everything he says to the public is uh, designed to achieve the objectives that he has. So uh, that what he said there may well have been uh, in order to please the domestic audience and to say, look how I own this American journalist. Um, much And much of what he said in the interview with Tucker was designed uh, to, to hit a couple of different points. One, to please a domestic audience, which, which loves nothing more than look how he owned that American, destroyed him with facts and logic. Um, and the other thing is, of course, to... Uh, look presidential and majestic confident. and confident to a Western audience who's used to seeing geriatrics falling over themselves and being unable to complete sentences uh, as their leaders. So, so on, do you feel like overall it was a success for him? For Putin, massive success. Yeah, massive success. Konstantin, thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. That was Konstantin Kissin, friend of the show and host of the brilliant Trigonometry channel. We thought it was just worth bringing him in because... It's been quite interesting looking at Tucker Carlson over the past few months, ever since he left Fox, and both of us have a sort of professional interest in where where we would go. What is the line? Has he crossed it? And as I confessed pretty plainly there, to me, he has somehow crossed a line, and it worries me. But you may feel differently, and as always, let us know what you think, and come back soon. This was Unheard. <laughs>